you know, we can talk in circles and we can talk for days. Um, but what is the action behind that? Welcome to Natural Collisions, brought to you by Coac Detroit. Conversations about the challenges and opportunities in the nonprofit sector, highlighting the voices and nonprofit work in Detroit and Southeast Michigan and beyond. I'm your host, Chardonnay Sanders, Program Manager at Coac Detroit. In today's Natural Collisions conversation, we are discussing the Nonprofit Funder Dialogue Series, a program hosted in partnership between the Dorothy A. Johnson Center at Grand Valley State University and Coac Detroit, with facilitation provided by the Eureka Group. With this series, we wanted to create a brave space where nonprofit organizations and foundations could challenge traditional roles and power dynamics and develop deeper and more trusting relationships and ask the questions, how can nonprofit and foundation leaders work collaboratively to get more resources into organizations led by Black, Indigenous, and other people of color? And what transformative opportunities are possible when partners demonstrate transparency and vulnerability? A few of the colliders for this conversation took part in the series of three virtual dialogues between Detroit-based Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, also known as BIPOC, nonprofit leaders, and foundations that kicked off in May of 2021. Our guests understand that candid conversations, even if uncomfortable, are necessary between funders and nonprofit leaders for transformation to occur in our sector. This episode dives into the conversations and recommendations uplifted from the Nonprofit Funder Dialogue series. Our guests this month are Tamika Ramsey. Hi, my name is Tamika Ramsey. I am the former co-director of Michigan Voices. I am currently the director of the Michigan Coalition on Black Civic Participation, which works with about six state organizations that are ran by people of color to help executive directors learn how to do their job, learn how to grow their organization, and make sure that Black people have a space to be heard. I appreciate being in this work as a Black woman. You know, I, I tell people all the time, social justice isn't a movement for me, it's a lifestyle. And making sure that I am creating a future that I can be proud of and that my grandkids and my great grandkids can flourish in. Kyle Caldwell. I'm Kyle Caldwell. I'm President and CEO of the Council of Michigan Foundation. We are a regional association of grant makers. Uh, we work to strengthen Michigan philanthropy with an equity-centered lens. And the work that we've been focused on more recently is helping foundations figure out better, more productive engagements with nonprofit partners, and that makes this dialogue really important for us. Leslie Slavitt. I'm Leslie Slavitt. I'm the executive director of the Dorothy Johnson Center for Philanthropy. We have the privilege of working across the sector, really with the focus of making philanthropy better. And when we make philanthropy better, we better allow the aspirations and hopes and dreams of all members of our community to thrive and to move forward as they so desire in their lives and in their neighborhoods. So that's what we're about. That's what gets us up in the morning and very privileged to be here and be part of these conversations. Maria Salinas. My name is Maria Salinas. I am executive director and founder of Congress of Communities, Southwest Detroit. We do primarily leadership development in all areas of work in the city of Detroit. We work with zero to early learning. We work with youth. We work with parent leaders, adults, and seniors. We are the boots on the ground community organizers. Again, we work in every aspect of work in the city from health to housing to political issues, anything to do with our residents. We are, res we are resident driven. And that's what we represent as the residents of all Detroit, but dominantly Southwest Detroit and executive director of Coac Detroit, Alondra Bolger. 
My name is Alondra Bolger. I have the distinct honor and privilege of serving as the inaugural executive director at COAC Detroit. COAC is a hub for nonprofit organizations in Southeast Michigan, and the primary goal of our mission is to accelerate collaboration and amplify the amazing work of the nonprofits in our region. Before we jump in, Alondra Bolger takes a moment to really unpack why the Nonprofit Funder Dialogue series started and the importance of this body of work. You know, the idea behind the Nonprofit Funder Dialogue series really started a couple of years before we had the conversation. So I had had some early dialogue with the Johnson Center out of Grand Valley State University, given their work in the philanthropic community and our aspirations in the nonprofit community about how our work might intersect. And one of the things that we wanted to really focus on was bringing nonprofit leaders and funders together to have open, transparent conversations. Um, and so we start, We actually started this work in June of 2019 when we launched COAC. And as part of our two-day launch, we actually had a panel discussion where we invited the nonprofit community into our space, but also funders, and particularly in that instance, funders from outside of our community so that we could model what that conversation could look like. Um, coming out of that experience, we wanted to deepen our partnership with the Johnson Center. And so between May of 2021 in May of 2022, we held three conversations that were designed to really take a look at how we might amplify impact between funders and nonprofit leaders and really co-create solutions for social change if we embrace transparency and trust and vulnerability. So that was really the impetus behind the, the conversations. I think the other thing that I would lift up is, you know, we can talk in circles and we can talk for days, um, but what is the action behind that? And so we also wanted to ground those conversations around equity and in particular, how we might get more resources into BIPOC led and BIPOC serving organizations. Thank you, Alondra. And today's conversation is an extension of the nonprofit funder dialogue series. Let's jump into the conversation with a discussion about the inherent power dynamics between funders and nonprofits, and how these dynamics have been challenged more recently. And what was happening a lot was just traditionally, they kind of had their objectives and, and uh, deliverables, and you kind of just followed what they asked you to do. Now, in the last five years, and I'm doing reparation on that, my own leadership, you know, questioning, you know, what, what was going on, and a lot of it's fear. Because I had to, I had staff to su sustain. I had an organization I was trying to get up and running, and so you kind of just become a compliant, you know, re recipient of, of the money. Um, yes, you know, you stay strong on some things, but we couldn't be what I call candid. Uh, there was no comfort zone. You really couldn't be brave because you know you had to think about workers and and just sustainability of what you had. More recently, it's shifted, I think intentionally. I believe that probably five, seven, seven years ago, roughly six years ago, the, these are funders that I know started talking to organizations and asking the questions, what can we do better? And coming into the communities. And so more recently, we have much a much better partnership, a lot more unrestricted money, which is amazing for its for nonprofits to have that flexibility. And it's allowed us to, to soar in ways that in the past, generationally, we couldn't. So I think from my, in, in my experience, the dynamic has shifted for better. Uh, we do have a little bit more work to do, but that, be, that depends on us. So thank you. I'll speak personally. And so I guess I'm hitting probably three decades, all in the sort of nonprofit, civic, philanthropic sector. And I've gone in and out of it. I've gone into different components of the sector, rather, across my career. So I've been a funder probably from four different perspectives. And I've also been at the nonprofit side of things as well. And so, you know, I always believed, you know, Grants are only as good as the wonderful organizations doing deeply meaningful and effective work. Foundations, you know, not to say people don't work hard and mean well and are thoughtful and reflective and intentional where they can be and 
Um, obviously, the larger the foundation gets, the more layers of administration and structure is around them. And not all foundations, you know, are alike. But uh, we don't actually do the work when we're in that kind of grant making role. And so, you know, for me personally, being able to be in community, being able to listen and understand, you know, and help to navigate and bridge opportunities and help uh, network and make connections that I could bring to bear were what I could offer to these sort of what I always took to be collaborative, engaged, and open conversations. I can tell you from my experience, I, again, worked in four different kinds of philanthropies. Um, two were actually very similar, um, and the other two were very different. And even the two that were very similar, man behind the curtain, they were entirely different. <laughs> the discretion, the ability I had to advocate, what would sway decision makers, all entirely different, even if on the surface, it looked very similar. And so for me, doing sort of the same job twice in two different industries was fascinating in that context, you know. And so and you know, communication is so key and coming to this work with genuineness, with integrity, and with an openness to listening and learning and interactive and collegial open, honest relationships has for me always been key across, you know, these decades of work that I've been privileged to do. Yeah, I, I join you all in, in celebrating decades of service in the sector. My background started a little bit differently in that I started in state government, and my job was to help uh, nonprofits and foundations and citizens come together around service and volunteerism. And uh, that taught me a lot about how Michigan works. And when I think about the nonprofit sector broadly and in, in, in philanthropy, you know, I came to realize very quickly that there was an inherent belief, value, and incentives for collaboration in Michigan, where funders collaborated, nonprofits collaborated, and it was sort of written into the DNA. You'd often see it in a grant application. Who are you collaborating with, right? So it, there was always this incentive. And the ethos, though, of the field was how do you have productive and healthy grant maker, grant seeker relationships? And that's literally how we defined it. And so as I moved throughout the what, what we call the infrastructure space. You know, I don't, I didn't work very long with uh, directly with nonprofits that deliver services or foundations that deliver resources. I was always in the business of supporting those systems, running the Michigan Nonprofit Association, the formerly at the Johnson Center, then here now at the Council of Michigan Foundations. But in that whole space, I've seen this sort of evolution where there is a transactional relationship. There's power dynamics in that. So at the time when I started, you know, grant maker, grant seeker relationships was seen as avant garde, and now it seems as though it's it's really common. And so it sort of moved from this idea of grant maker, grant seeker relationships being healthy and productive, but still transactional, to now I think we're we're, we're beginning to understand that there's an ecosystem that we all live in of nonprofits and funders and community all working together to make life better for folks and. I think we, we're kind of evolving to this idea of what, what does it mean to be co-equal partners in community engagement rather than what does it mean to be in this financially mutually beneficial relationship where funders fund work that, through nonprofits to, to have a community impact. And I think that really got accelerated in, in the pandemic and the dialogue that we had uh, here in this project started before the pandemic and then rolled right into uh, the pandemic. So I think we all talked about some things that have been different over the last five years or so, but I think it really got accelerated uh, in the pandemic where we're now we're talking about mutual accountability and what does it mean to, to be responsive philanthropy? What does it mean to be in relationship with, with nonprofit and nonprofit leaders? And how do, we, how do we make this pivot to understanding what it means to center the nonprofit in this relationship as opposed to centering the goals solely of the foundation. And so I, I tend to agree that there's been a lot of change. And I think the pandemic just gave us a real laser focus about, okay, we've got this big problem. What is it that we essentially have to do and should do to be most effective? And the question I think for all of us will be how much of that sticks. Coac Detroit is built on collaborative networks. Alondra Bolger and Lastly Slavitt explains what brought Coac Detroit and the Dorothy A. Johnson Center for Philanthropy together to convene the Nonprofit Funder Dialogue Series and deliver its recommendations. 
So the series itself was a collaboration between COAD Detroit, the Dorothy A. Johnson Center at Grand Valley State University, and the Eureka Group, who provided facilitation support to the project. We actually convened two groups, one in Grand Rapids and the other in Detroit. And so the participants in the dialogue were composed of foundation leaders or philanthropic leaders um, in both communities. Um, so folks who are generally in decision making positions and roles in those organizations. And then we also invited BIPOC, Black, Indigenous and people of color, lead nonprofit leaders from both of those regions to engage in conversation as well. Absolutely. And so full disclosure to share, well, I'm incredibly privileged that the legacy of this work is something that I get to stand in the shoes of those who were before me. I was not the executive director of the Johnson Center at the time this work was initiated or came to fruition. And so my speaking on this is my reflection on the importance of the work from a sector perspective. Though an invested stakeholder, I was not privileged to be a direct partner in, in this work. And so I do want to make sure that that's clear and, and understood. You know, Again, to make philanthropy better, we have to bring the actors together. The shared ability to problem solve, to bring solutions forward, to ensure that the infrastructure necessary to address the issues in our community require that level of authentic understanding, authentic being in relationship with one another, and the ability to speak honestly to address issues. Because if we don't do that, we will be no better off in this world, in our communities, in this sector, for the for the people for whom we get up and do this work every day of our lives. And so to bring forward, A, that knowledge of the gaps we needed to navigate, of the roads we needed to walk together, in itself required a level of honesty and transparency to name that and then to bring people to the table to engage one another in conversation openly and honestly in ways that aren't always easy to and in fact ways that are darn right difficult to do not just not easy right and so the fact of it is so critical the tone and the initiative to take those steps so critical and then we come to the report and the shared recommendations so i think there's so much of importance not least of which is the product right but also the product and the experience and the naming of the need to do that. Um, and so I think its importance in that context cannot be understated. As a result of the dialogue series, eight shared recommendations were uplifted. Number one, funders should assess who they are not funding. Number two, funders should practice proactive philanthropy. Number three, Better align foundation goals with community needs. Number four, funders need to hear and nonprofits need to share the whole story about the organization. Number five, work to educate foundation staff, trustees, and donors about systemic challenges and power dynamics and share successful strategies. Number six, streamline application and reporting and provide more general operating support and multi-year funding. Number seven, build opportunities for grantees to cooperate rather than compete. And number eight, support rest our natural collisions guests discuss the recommendations that came out of the series that most resonates with them i think for me with better aligned foundation goals with community needs you know it's also our responsibility to draw the picture and and i think for me it's 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 do it by example and then share it with colleagues and and other nonprofits, but it was really like there was things that we needed that we would we didn't know how to bring forth to the foundations because you also want them to think you're you're strong and everything, but you're addressing all these you know systematic issues, condition issues, and mindsets. So even though we work with system 
change, condition change, which is the words of the funders, it, it's, it's mindset change. And there was a time that they were not funding people projects because they couldn't be, be measured. People cannot be measured, but you, they can. We had to be really frank that we could do this and get residents to levels of taking over the work. But it would take double the money, double the tears, double the patience. And, and the way of doing it to come back to the foundations that they would have to go back to their board of trustees because we, under, you know, I understood that. I understood that dynamic, and that's why I think I became very good at it because I was in a university setting for 20 years, and with, even though I was brought up in Detroit and I had a lot of bad habits, I dismantled a lot of that, relearned it, and understood what it took to actually have uh, legitimate outcomes and deliverables that the foundations had to have to go back to the board of trustees and say, you know, this money is being allocated effectively. And so for me, it was a lot of having to draw the picture and really helping my colleagues understand that in our world of nonprofit, we have funders that didn't come into the neighborhoods. And even the funders that did come into the neighborhoods, they're coming into a dog and pony show. Let's just be real. Everybody's got their best clothes on, they're cleaning up their places and they're on their best behavior. You know, but go into the hood, go into really, go into the schools or something like that. And that's that's basically, for me, it was really, you know, being that navigator, broker, facilitator, connector, and, and not being scared to say, you know, this is happening in our neighborhood. And the reality is, it might sound bad, but if we don't address these situations, we can't get our people to the point of having them produce effectively what you want us to do, you know, for them just to open up their minds. We have to address food issues, child care issues, transportation issues, and all that's not in the grant, you know? You're giving us money to do a program. And, and, and back in the day, it was like we used to get federal money. There was millions of dollars that in the 70s and 80s that would come in to help us address our, our community resident issues. Now we do it with hundreds of thousands of dollars from philanthropy. philanthropy uh, and so I get that. So for me, it was really that one that, you know, pretty much aligning the foundation goals with community needs and stepping up. And, and, and it's my responsibility to help make that happen so they understood it. And then to share it with colleagues, you know, these practices. And I feel that that has, in my in my experience, really opened up a lot of doors for me and my agency. And also, uh, you know, you walk the walk and talk the talk. You know, being able to give my funders what they need it allows them to give me what I need. So my grants got bigger because they understood the need was bigger. And so it's a win-win situation. So that was my best one. I think for me, it is the funding of general operating. A lot of the nonprofits that I work with, most of them that I am a part of, really focus on the hardest hit communities. And when we say we focus on them, we not only serve them, but we welcome them in as employees. So when you, when I tell you that I have a re-entry organization and I am hiring those who are the most impacted, that means that I am bringing in all of their issues with them. So the transportation issues, the childcare issues. A lot of times we hear funders say, self-care is important, but there's no funding for self-care. There's no funding for adequate childcare. There's no funding for me to give bus tickets to my staff just to get to work. So then we go to hiring people who are not the most impacted because they have the less issues, the least amount of issues that we have to deal with. So then we have people who have never been in those situations helping people and, and they're not relating. But if we hire those people, then we take on a lot, a lot of issues, a lot of work that is not funded or paid for. And so there are a lot of times that organizations will go ahead and just work and fund and do a lot of outside philanthropy work 
just to sustain the staff that it takes to then get the funding from philanthropy. And so if we are saying that we want to start to empower those with the with the most impacted, use their voices, then we also have to be willing and able and ready to compensate them and provide them with the support systems that they need. If I am telling you I'm working with a lot of single moms, then that means that we are going to have child care issues. We're going to have, you know, when there are snow days and people cannot come into work because they don't have child care. The pandemic showed this entire country how much we as working class people rely on the school system to be able to help us with child care. And so when those things are not in place, you know, we heard that people didn't want to come back to work. But when the pandemic was, quote unquote, over, child cares were taking on less children, right, because they were trying to be safe. So you had a, a, a daycare who normally would have 20 kids, only have 10. And so now my 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 staff don't have adequate child care. Do I penalize them and they lose their jobs because of that? Or do I make a way for that to happen? And a lot of nonprofits, because of funders, because of that flexibility, because of the pandemic, were able to support their, their staff, right? But it shouldn't take a global pandemic for philanthropy to understand that it really does need to be more flexible, that we are dealing with real life people with real life issues. And if we are going into the most marginalized and impacted communities and we're actually trying to help them, we need to be able to help the the organizations that employ them as well. Thank you. Yeah, I, I kind of want to just say something about, you know, we became frontline workers. And, and I think that you hear nurses and you hear all the doctors and the firemen and the policemen, but community organizers and our nonprofits really became frontline workers. We didn't, we didn't stop. When the pandemic happened, we had to, in fact, we, we had to double up and be out there and address the needs of our working class poor, you know, our poverty, our, our residents of poverty, and making sure that, you know, they were accommodated. Uh, that's what we do as community organizers. And so also, you know, in this, in this opportunity as funders are shifting the way they're doing things and we're getting more unrestricted money. I think it's it's bringing up the that point as we need to make these quality of life careers and and get rid of the starving artist mentality. You know that social workers, teachers, community organizers. You know we and so that has to start, and it is already because I I had to raise my, the salary of my workers just to keep them because for them to come in because they're being offered jobs that'll pay them thirty, forty thousand dollars more a year to stay home because they have degrees and they have experience and 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 so, you know, really this shift is also convincing philanthropy is we need more money to pay our, our frontline workers, you know, our workers and nonprofits. And putting that down in grants that that has to happen and, and start shifting the whole starving artist mentality, and we can we can uh, you know we can allocate these the funders money more effectively, but they have to be true to what the real cost factor is, and and we can't be continue to be pimped anymore. Thank you. I I agree, and even though the report was, you know, done and shared out previously, you know these issues don't go away or don't get better unless we actively work on them. We take steps to make change. And I just want to bring something up because in one of the communities where um, the report did the focus groups, I had a conversation. Um, it was actually, in fact, yesterday. So it's like deeply on my mind about a critically important community issue where honestly funders are comfortable sort of stepping in where the problem is really downstream, right? There was a conversation about like understanding that problem and solutions that directly try to meet that problem and having a conversation with uh, community stakeholders uh, as i was doing about how we want to go upstream on the problem we want that problem to actually go away because we want to engage in practices that 
well far upstream, right? Which not only makes that end problem, you know, go away, it so changes the trajectory and the experience and the opportunities and the branching, you know, in our in our communities. And so I was having a conversation just yesterday. And so this goes to the second recommendation about how funders should sort of better align foundation goals with community needs. And so I was talking with some people. I said, "All right, we're gonna we're gonna reconvene this conversation, and we're gonna figure out how to reframe the thinking to get to get upstream, <laughs> you know, on the interventions and the and the frustration about how difficult it is to change that connection point and what we need to do to make that happen." We've had conversations about the report before, and I I didn't go directly first to sort of the third recommendation, but that conversation like stayed with me all evening, <laughs> you know, and into today. Uh, and so I'm, and so that just is really resonating with me at at the moment, you know. And so just just sharing that out, you know, again. Well, I, I appreciate hearing that, and I think it has a lot to do with what Maria said by engaging community. When we have people go door to door just to remind people to vote. When we do that in the fall time, let's say it's in October, and somebody's knocking on a door and somebody comes to the door and it's dark inside and we know why it's dark inside right but they're not going to admit it and and we can talk about <laughs> an election that's happening and how your voice is important but until you get those utilities on that that person doesn't hear anything and so it becomes our job to not only understand the presenting cause like because the it, the only way people will hear you is to to get their presenting needs uh dealt with but also to understand what the root cause is and then what maria and i do we teach people how to get from that presenting cause to the root cause and that is not something that happens overnight it takes a long time for people to understand that in order for my lights to be turned on, one, I have to pay them. But two, I also have to advocate because the utility companies keep raising the rates. So I need to know who my elected official is. So I need to be more involved. Like that, that takes some time. And that's not time that we're always given. So I think like us being able to have the wherewithal and unrestricted funding to start having those type of conversations in community can get us to that point. But it is it is a process that takes a lot of time that we have been trying to. But when you're so in survival mode and fundraising just to c cover the, the presenting issues, then we become ineffective because we are trying to survive and not looking at the long term big picture of how to get people from A to Z because we're always stuck on A. We're trying to get A funded every single time. And then and then we lose, you know, that longevity and those conversations in order to get people from A to Z. Thank you. So well said. I think because of the voice of nonprofits sort of informing funders about what they they need to do. And the recommendation that sort of rings out for me is to align around community needs, which I think is what we've kind of all talked about. And one of the clearest examples I think right now that we're seeing is this pivot to direct cash assistance to individuals and families. Uh, the RX Kids program that just got launched in Flint, I think is a great example of trying to figure out, well, if rather than building up a program that someone has to then engage with, that then eventually gets them support, gives the resources directly to the families and the individuals and empower them to make their, their own individualized solution because every person is different. And when we think about having to address the lead uh, contamination and some of the effects to children and families, each child, each parent has got to take that on in, in a unique way to their, to their context. So that would have been a pretty radical positioning for philanthropy to even think about that role because we would have traditionally said that's the public sector's role. Right, so there's this now experimentation that that philanthropy is sort of, I think, stepping into, and obviously to scale this, it's going to have to take on a, a bigger role with the public sector. But to even you know start from this approach of direct assistance to individuals by a grant maker uh, through through uh, nonprofit partners, I think is a pretty pretty unique pivot to understanding how to work around community needs. 
I think the, uh, the other piece that I think is is interesting for us to think about is because of the dialogues that we've been having over the last two or three years coming out of the pandemic and the need to do trust-based philanthropy and what does that mean and will it stick, seeing a lot more funders do sort of their self-audit. Uh, I was really intrigued by the Skillman Foundation, Go, just going back through and saying, okay, let's look at ourselves, just do a raw assessment around equity and racial equity, and then whatever comes back, we need to share it. We need to say this is what we found and be, so that we publicly put it out there and make ourselves accountable. I think more and more of that sort of uh, new behavior would not have been possible without nonprofits saying, look, if, if, if we're going to get into this trusting relationship, this is how you need to change, right? And it's not just us nonprofits being more effective, being more efficient. We need this reciprocal change and accountability in, in, our, in our system in order for us to really meet community needs. What happens next? Since the Nonprofit Funder Dialogue series created this brave space for funders and nonprofit leaders to connect, what has happened since? I asked our guests to share their final words and what's to come from the series for each of them. I can do that. I believe that this is a, a, a process. It is not somewhere where we can get to the finish line. I believe that relationships between philanthropy and nonprofits will continue to grow. There may be hiccups along the way as there are in any relationships, but I think we are on the other side of it. And I appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I have a one year old daughter and I we had a, a dinner and I was talking to her and her friend and I was like, y'all got to get y'all life together. And so I spent the next hour. I fed them very well. I'm um, telling them that they needed to get their life together. And afterward, I was like, OK, are we all good? And my daughter was like, you know, it's hard to hear about what what you're not doing good at and be and smile. And so <laughs> I say that to say, I appreciate that philanthropy is taking this very hard look at themselves because, you know, the history of philanthropy, you know, sometimes can be very dogmatic when it comes to the nonprofit industrial complex um, and a lot of people who work in this field. So I appreciate that we are that 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 even happened, right? Because it's hard sometimes to take that hard look. So I appreciate that. And just want to say that, you know, it is a journey that we must continue on together if we are to build a better country um, and, and we get this right. I think that it's, it's very important that we continue these steps and continue to hold each other accountable in love and to continue to move forward. And so I thank all of you for even starting that journey and taking it on and continuing to walk it, even though I know there are times when it can be difficult. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with Tamika uh, wholeheartedly. Getting more non-restricted money, I believe that that's helping us. Being able to actually write into our grants, stip stipends and incentives, maybe not stipends, but incentives. Now we're paying our residents for their value, their voice and their value. Everybody else gets paid. And so seeing the value in that. And I think, you know, we, for me, it, it's we're on, we're on a path. Having new leadership, you mentioned the Skillman Foundation. I mean, they have done an amazing job, really true self-care and wellness and addressing that monetarily to their grantees. And so they're they're setting a tone. And other, other funders are kind of following, you know, shifting leadership is helping. But also have an experience of, of, le of leaders that, you know, have been in charge before, you know, making sure that, you know, we're, we are being true and, and letting foundations know what we need. Having that candid conversation, that safe space uh, and stepping out of our comfort zone. I, I encourage my colleagues to continue doing that because I believe we are on the path. And I thank everybody for that, that that's here and that can continue your advocacy at your level, and we will continue our advocacy at our level. Thank you. Deeply inspiring. I'm, I don't think I have anything more wise or profound or deeply meaningful to add. That said, I think that it's all of our responsibilities. You know, we look ourselves, you know, in the proverbial mirror every day, and we only see what we know, right? Within a, a safe context of not shaming or blaming or 
a deficit mindset, right? But an asset mindset to open people's eyes to opportunities and seeing things differently and learning new new ways of working and thinking and engaging. You know, we all have to bring to it that openness and that humility. And so doing that collectively in a space that has a shared pathway and a shared what we all want to see at the end of the day and sort of operationalizing to that kind of North Star, which is the reason we all do this work as opposed to some other work. Um, and so just uh, hopefully as just furthering in, in a small way what both Maria and Tamika has, have already said so beautifully. I agree totally. And I think the most profound change that I've noticed is first off that we have seven funders, the Fry Foundation, Grand Rapids Community Foundation, Ralsey Wilson Foundation, Skillman Foundation, and uh, one of our corporate Lake Michigan Credit Union, Hudson Weber and Steelcase Foundation, other corporate, coming together to fund a series that pushes them to change behavior. I think that's that's a fundamental shift that we're seeing. And as the series is entitled, the other thing that I think I've seen a lot more of is that, you know, this series is about nonprofits under dialogue, getting resources to organizations led by people of color. That's an equity play, that's a racial equity play for philanthropy to think about with its nonprofit partners and, and this whole ecosystem. So I think that whole shift to really putting uh, equity at the center of philanthropy's work is increasingly more and more an expectation, not sort of avant-garde and, and that fronting edge that only some explore. I think more and more is becoming a charge a self-imposed charge based on what we hear from community on philanthropy to lead. And so I think that new space of centering equity broadly, but racial equity imperatively is, is a big shift that I'm, I'm really excited to see and, and look forward to that work continuing in the future. And just thank everyone for being part of this great dialogue. This is exactly the kind of work that we all need to be thinking about uh, sector-wide. Thank you to all of our guests. Maria Salinas, Executive Director of Congress of Communities. Learn more at congressofcommunities.com. Lastly, Slavic, Executive Director of the Dorothy A. Johnson Center for Philanthropy at Grand Valley State University. Find out more at johnsoncenter.org. Kyle Caldwell, President and CEO of Council of Michigan Foundations. Learn more at michiganfoundations.org. Tamika Ramsey of T. Ramsey and Associates. Follow her at T. Ramsey LLC.com. And Alondra Boger, Executive Director at COAC Detroit. To learn more about the Nonprofit Funder Dialogue series and to download the actual report, visit coacdetroit.org slash NPFD. This has been the Natural Collisions Podcast from COAC Detroit. Remember, the word COAC itself means to work together because we know we cannot have transformational impact if we only work alone. To learn more about our work, visit coacdetroit.org. Please subscribe to Natural Collisions on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. We will be back with more conversations soon. Thank you for listening.